Warning. The following podcast might be too truthful for most liberals. Listener discretion is therefore advised. Welcome to the Tea Party Power Hour. I am your host, Mark Galar. Today, my guest is none other than Senator Ted Cruz, who represents the great state of Texas. He's here to talk to us about his brand new book, already a bestseller, Unwoke, How to Defeat Cultural Marxism in America. Senator Cruz, welcome to the show and good morning from Aggie Land. Thank you, Mark. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you know it. This book has struck me as being one of the best books on Marxism that I've read. I I would have to say in the last 90 days, I've probably read about a half dozen books on Marxism. But after reading this one, two things jumped out at me. One, you did an excellent job of answering the question that everyone's asking now. How did we get into this mess? Where did wokeism come from? You did a great job of tracing it all the way back to Karl Marx to modern day wokeism. And the other thing is, it's at the end of the book, you offer solutions. You're not just pointing stuff out and whining about it. You've actually got some practical common sense solutions as to what Americans can do. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is start out at the beginning. You did this nice evolution from Karl Marx to Gramsci to Duchki to Marcuse and, and all the way down to modern wokeism. But let's start with Karl Marx, the man. I was shocked to learn a lot of things about Karl Marx that I didn't know before. Tell us a little bit about this guy from a personal standpoint. Well, look, he, he was a, a hideous human being. He was a drunk. He was a racist. He was completely irresponsible. He didn't provide for his family. He didn't provide for his kids. And the doctrine that he created, Marxism, which became communism, has been responsible for more misery has been responsible for more death, more suffering, more poverty than any doctrine in history. And you mentioned at the outset, this book was trying to explain what the hell's happening yes. in America. That's, that's exactly why I wrote it, because we see that our country, things have gone crazy and and. Millions of people are wondering, how did this happen and how did it happen so quickly? And what this book endeavors to do is, is it examines how and why the radical left seized every major institution in America. And it, it was not accidental. It was deliberate. It, it was what Marxist theorists called the long, slow march through institutions. They very deliberately set out. It began in the 60s and 70s to capture institutions from inside. And so the book starts, uh, each chapter focuses on a different institution. So it starts with universities. And, and, and I call universities the Wuhan lab of the woke virus. Yes. Universities are where it was created, where it mutated, where it spread. And from universities, it goes to K through 12 education. It goes to journalism. It goes to government. It goes to big business. It goes to big tech. It goes to entertainment, movies, TV, music, sports. It goes to science. And then the last chapter of the book is on China, which is a central nexus that connects all of them. And the book endeavors to, number one, explain precisely how the cultural Marxist sees these institutions from within. But then, number two, as you rightly noted, it lays out a clear, practical plan to take these institutions back, how we can fight and take them back, because if we don't take the institutions back, we will lose our country. It certainly seems like we're headed in that direction. Now, one of the things you mentioned a minute ago is that Karl Marx was undoubtedly a racist. You point out in the book, he doesn't like blacks, he doesn't like Hispanics, he doesn't like Jews, he denigrates Mexicans uh, whom he believes are inferior. And I just wondered, did anybody tell the founders of Black Lives Matter who proudly describe themselves as trained Marxist that this guy's a racist? Because I, I find it ironic that these people are proudly saying we're trained Marxist 
and they seem to have no idea that Karl Marx was a racist. Well, look, for the, for the radical left, that, they don't really care. Mm. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter to them that there is – look, Marxism is about control and power. And it's not about consistency. It's not about coherence. You know, George or- Orwell beautifully wrote in, in 1984 how two plus two equals five, if that's what the state mandates it to be. And if you look at, at listen, communist governments throughout the world are corrupt. The communist leaders live like billionaires. Fidel Castro and Brother Raul Castro live like billionaires. They live opulent wealth. Vladimir Putin is a billionaire. Some have speculated he might be the richest man in the world. The leaders of Hamas, the four leaders of Hamas are collectively worth $11 billion. They fly around on private jets. Mm. Marxism is profoundly hypocritical. And it is all about using power to force obedience and to enforce control. And so Black Lives Matter, whether they knew or not that Marx was a vicious racist, they don't care because it doesn't matter because for them, Marxism is about their power. By the way, the leaders of Black Lives Matter Mm-hmm. Took the millions of dollars they raised from corporate America and they bought multi million dollar mansions. Right. The hypocrisy is, is a consistent element of the radical left. Now, another characteristic of the radical left is that they don't really allow dissent. Now, you took us through a little journey to the halcyon days of your college career. And you talked about how you would debate with people and have heated debates with people. But then when it was all over, you'd go out and have a beer with them. Now, those days are gone. Now, if you dissent, you're canceled. You're attacked. They come after your livelihood. There is no more agreeing to disagree, is there? Look, that's absolutely right. The the radical left does not believe in free speech. They punish dissent, and, and there's a reason for that. Their ideas are profoundly unpopular. And, and this is why one of the strategies for taking the institutions back is sunlight and transparency. Because if you think about it, no reasonable, rational person supports abolishing the police. That is a nutty idea. Right. No reasonable, rational person supports open borders and the chaos at our southern border. No reasonable, rational person supports medically sterilizing and castrating little children. And no reasonable or rational person supports and celebrates Hamas terrorists who are raping and murdering women and children. Those are the ideas, the positions of the radical left. And so they cannot rely on persuasion. Instead, they rely on brute force and they rely on indoctrination. So brute force, they will silence you, they will cancel you, they will censor you, they will fire you. They will rely on power to force you to comply. Or indoctrination, they will flood you with propaganda. And it's why the left gets seeks and has gotten control over universities in K-12 and journalism and entertainment. It's all about constant indoctrination. By the way, We're seeing the fruits of the cultural Marxist takeover with all of these viciously anti-Semitic protests at universities across the the country because these young people have been indoctrinated. Yeah. And we keep hearing about all the citizen deaths in Gaza, but they don't seem to have one ounce of concern for all the Israelis that were killed by Hamas in very, very brutal, I'd even go as far as to say demonic ways. Yeah. I, I, this whole thing that, well, we just care about the little kids in, in Gaza. I mean, why don't you care about the little kids in Israel? And they don't really know. They don't know much about anything. If you ask the young Marxist why they believe in climate change, they can't tell you. They say that if you don't agree there's 600 genders, you're denying science. I, I mean... <laughs> It's really sad the extent to which 
young people in our country have been brainwashed through the institutions. Let me bring up another thing, too, about the success of the Marxist, as far as you had mentioned, some of these things are coming to fruition. Talk to us about the role that corporate America plays. I mean, even at a time when we're seeing, and you did a great job of discussing Target and Bud Light and Disney in the book, but these large corporations don't even seem to mind losing money, losing billions in market cap because they'd rather embrace the woke ideology. But I know that ESG has a lot to do with that. DEI, you said, has a lot to do with that. You mentioned corporate equity index. I hadn't even heard of that one. But you said the large capital companies like BlackRock, a guy named Larry Fink heading that up, play a huge role in forcing a lot of corporations to go along with this. Could you explain that to our listeners? Well, sure. And, and, and it again, is about money and power. And, and so the chapter on big business, you know, it's worth at the outset pausing and, and, and saying, you know, even 10 years ago, if I would have told you that corporate America, that the Fortune 100 would become the economic enforcers for the radical left wing in America, that would have been a loopy thing to say. You would have thought it was bizarre to claim that. Because it just was not something that seemed even remotely plausible until we woke up and looked around, and that's exactly what they were doing. And one of the things that I explain in this book is, is the reason is that even a few years ago, if you were a Fortune 100 CEO, and let's say you're utterly apolitical, you don't care about politics, it was rational to give in to the woke mob. Because they came at you with pitchforks and torches, and they came at you with threats. They came at you, they attacked you on Twitter, they attacked you from within with your employees, these young 20-somethings that you've hired out of school that are all worked up and angry. That They come at you from your shareholders, they come at you from your board of directors, and the rational thing was simply give in. That the cost of giving in were much, much smaller than the benefits. Now, this is a reason to be optimistic because I think that has changed in significant part. And one of the most important pieces of the strategies I lay out in this book, if we want to take the institution back, we've got to change the cost-benefit ledger. And as you noted, I talked at length about what happened with Bud Light and what happened with Target, where Bud Light, they went woke, they looked down on their customers, and they utterly destroyed their brand. Bud Light went from the number one selling beer in America to it's not even in the top 10. They obliterated $30 billion in market cap. Likewise, Target. Target did the same thing. And by the way, it was, you know, if you look at the senior executives at Target when that scandal was unfolding, they were saying, we don't want to be another Bud Light. We don't want to be another Bud Light. That is important to disincentivize the next corporate CEO thinking of going woke. And I also discuss one of the really important tools that we can use is something Texas has done. So Texas, a couple of legislative sessions ago, the state legislature passed a bill called Senate Bill 13, which provides if you boycott oil and gas, Texas will boycott you. Excellent. Oil and gas provides millions of jobs in the state of Texas. And so the state legislature said, all right, if you're boycotting oil and gas, Our pension funds, our endowments, which are hundreds of billions of dollars, they will not invest with you. And I'll tell you, that has Wall Street terrified. Good. It's changing the cost-benefit analysis. And in the book, I urge other red states that likewise have hundreds of billions of dollars to to use them as well to press back as as one of the tools to take corporate America back. And and we need to take each and every one of these institutions back. Senator Cruz? Your people are telling me that you've got to go, so I am sorry that it's over this quickly. I'd love to have you back sometime to go into more depth about the book, but I also want to remind people that you have Verdict with Ted Cruz, which is one of the top podcasts in the country, if not the top podcast. So before you go, tell my listeners where they can buy your book, because I think by this point, they're going to want to get a copy. Well... Thank you, Mark. You can get the book anywhere books are sold. So you can get it in bookstores all across America. You can get it online at Amazon. You can 
get it at Barnes and Noble, you can get it at Books a Million. And, and I would encourage you go go today, go online and buy the book. And I will tell you, the book is also it's not an abstract academic treatise. It, it is filled with stories and real facts, and it's, it's written to be interesting and fun and engaging. And it's written to equip you, to equip you to understand what's happening in this country and also how we fight back. And, and I'll point out also that Christmas is right around the corner, and, and I think the book makes a, a terrific Christmas gift. So get it for your mom, uh, get it for your friends, or even better, get it for your kids, because your kids need to know what is going on to understand the indoctrination. And, and this book, as you noted, it's already a bestseller, which is driving the New York Times nuts. <laughs> and that's a very good thing. Always, always. Well, again, I know you have to go. Thank you so much for being here. And I was going to ask you whether you were going to throw your hat in the ring for the presidency again, but several other interviewers have beaten me to that this week. (laughs) So I'll just say I was quite pleased with the answer of yes, that you would consider it. And I know my listeners feel the exact same way. Once again, Senator Cruz, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Mark. God bless. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Tea Party Power Hour with Mark Gillard. 